Serving as your President General is the privilege of a lifetime, but having the opportunity to serve our national society during this, our 125th year, has been an extraordinary experience. As I travel from coast to coast and truly around the world, I am awed by your devotion to our ideals. You have demonstrated in thousands of ways the enduring relevancy of our mission. In projects large and small, you are fulfilling a pledge made by a small group of women in 1890 that future generations would remember, would appreciate, and would celebrate the sacrifice and values that make America the greatest nation on earth. And for that, I thank you and I salute you. I also thank Presley M. Wagoner, Honorary President General, who served as the chair of our Celebrate 125 Committee during this, our anniversary year. It is a joy for me to ask her to help us honor those who created and shaped the society we celebrate this evening. Mrs. Wagoner. Madam President General, we gather this evening in a magnificent hall in the heart of our nation's capital with a debt of gratitude to repay, a debt not only to our patriot ancestors and to the brave men and women who have worn the uniform of our nation's armed forces, but also a debt to the visionary citizens who 125 years ago laid the very foundation for this evening who together shared an ambitious and audacious undertaking to establish a nationwide organization to celebrate and perpetuate the American spirit, our beloved and enduring National Society, Daughters of the American Revolution. Tonight, we must pause to honor the patriotism, focus, and resiliency of those early leaders who so skillfully charted a course for the generations that would follow. The now familiar facts of our founding have been repeated many times, but tonight, by sharing fragments of their hopes, their motivations, their frustrations, in their own words from those first formative years, we hope that the dreams of those visionary leaders might echo down through the decades to propel us forward further still inspired anew in service to God, home, and country. We are fortunate that our founding members' dedication to preservation has left us with many treasures in our NSDAR archives, including much of the early correspondence, documentation, and meeting notes of our fledgling society 125 years ago. Mere months after the newly founded Sons of the American Revolution voted to exclude women from their society, a passionate supporter and advocate for female descendants of the Revolution began confidential correspondence with some of his like-minded brothers in the SAR. In a letter dated October 25, 1889, William McDowell writes, we shall invite the organization in the different states of the Union of the Daughters of the Revolution, independent entirely of the sons. I'm in a hurry to get at this work that I may show the sons what the daughters can do. On my suggestion, the vote on the subject yesterday was not recorded in our minutes for the reason that I wanted to save the gentlemen who voted no from being so thoroughly ashamed of themselves when they see what an opportunity they had and let slip by. After Mary Smith Lockwood wrote her rallying cry in the Washington Post and interested women began planning the new organization, the official organizing meeting was called for October 11, 1890 and included Mary Deshay, who as Secretary Pro Tem recorded in those meeting minutes this resolution. 
resolved that at this, our organizing meeting, we initiate the important part of our work, the securing and preserving of the historical spots of America and the erection thereon of suitable monuments to perpetuate the memories of the heroic deeds of the men and women who aided the revolution and created constitutional government in America by undertaking to do what we can towards completing the monument and the memory of Mary Washington, mother of George Washington. And we hereby call upon every patriot to send us a contribution, large and small, to our treasurer for this purpose. Just one day after that historic meeting of the newly formed Daughters of the American Revolution, Ms. DeShay sent a letter to Virginia Cabell informing her of an important assignment. My dear Mrs. Cabell, Mr. McDowell has appointed you, Mrs. Lockwood, Mrs. Darling, Mrs. Walworth, and me as committee to call on Mrs. Harrison to ask her acceptance of the office of President General. The time selected is 4.30 p.m. tomorrow afternoon, Monday, October 13th. The ladies will meet you at the White House. Five days after that meeting at the Executive Mansion, the Secretary to the First Lady of the United States sent a letter on behalf of Mrs. Harrison to say she would accept the position. In the days and months following, meetings and correspondence gave shape to the new society. As we all know, Many ideas are often put forth, but not always realized. Ellen Harden Walworth wrote to Mrs. Cabell a suggestion to consider for the society's motto. My dear Mrs. Cabell, it has occurred to me that I did not suggest for consideration, as I had intended, this simple motto for our seal, Amor Patriae, Love of Country. It seems to me that this might settle at once an objection already urged against us in a tendency to create an aristocracy, or at least a class sentiment, as it would point to the real inspiration of the association. From the minutes of the third and final organizing meeting on December 11, it is noted that the executive committee recommended that the motto Amor Patriae be changed to home and country. Also from this December meeting, the Vice President General presiding read aloud a telegram that had been sent from the Sons of the American Revolution. Resolved that the General Board of Managers of the Society of the Sons of the American Revolution extend its hearty sympathy to the Daughters of the American Revolution and their organization, and it assures them of cordial cooperation in their patriotic work. As the Daughters were finalizing their vision for the Society these first few months, William McDowell continued to show his support. In a letter to Mrs. Cavill on November 19, 1890, he writes in part. My dear Mrs. Cavill, I received a newspaper clipping giving an account of your meeting and believe that your society has a brilliant future before it. From the intensive meetings and correspondence of those early months, a constitution of the National Society was established. Our enduring objectives of historic pre preservation, education, and patriotism were detailed in that original DAR constitution and continue to guide our work today. Article two, objects of the society. The objects of this society are one, to perpetuate the memory and the spirit of the men and women who achieved American independence by the acquisition and protection of historical spots and the erection of monuments, by the encouragement of historical research in relation to the revolution and the publication of its results, by the preservation of documents and relics and of the records of the individual services of the revolutionary soldiers and patriots, 
and by the promotion of celebrations of all patriotic anniversaries. Two, to carry out the injunction of Washington in his farewell address to the American people, to promote, as an object of primary importance, institutions for the general diffusion of knowledge, thus developing an enlightened public opinion, and affording to the young and old such advantages as shall develop in them the largest capacity for performing the duties of American citizens. Three, to cherish, maintain, and extend the institutions of American freedom, to foster true patriotism and love of country, and to aid in securing for mankind all the blessings of liberty. Reflecting on how the society continued to grow in that first year, prolific writer and early historian general Mary Smith Lockwood described how word spread about the purpose of the society. Newspapers took up the cry and sent intelligence over the land. Application papers began to pour in. The American women were awakened by this revelation and now, what is it for, was answered with, it is not for an aristocracy but to honor the men who carried the muskets and the boys who beat the drums and fifed Yankee Doodle for liberty. For the honor of the women who served the country in their homes while the men were away fighting the battles for freedom and that their names should be rescued from the musty annals of the revolution and for the first time inscribed on the pages of history as factors in making the nation. At the First Continental Congress in February of 1892, Registrar General Eugenia Washington stressed the importance of preserving the stories and records of our revolutionary patriot ancestors and the importance of verifying documentation to ensure its integrity. The records of the services of these 1,306 patriots thus preserved form volumes of most interesting as well as valuable history. Yet this history will lose much of its value if the statements contained therein are not to be relied upon. Therefore, we recommend to the regents and delegates present to give an exact and full statement of the ancestor's service and authority for the statement. For these records, we should remember, are collected not only for present use, but shall stand through future generations as monuments to our noble sires. Our founders knew the importance of preserving those records in an appropriately prominent home for the society. Virginia Cavill addressed the membership at the First Continental Congress and prophetically described the magnificent DAR headquarters complex where we gather annually for our conference and which serves our membership and the entire Washington, D.C. community throughout the year as a brick and mortar testament to their visionary foresight. The building of a house, a house beautiful, to be the property of these American women calling themselves by inherited right, daughters of the American Revolution. This house will be built in or near the beautiful capital city named for Washington, the immortal. It should be the finest building ever owned by women. The fairest marbles from Vermont and Tennessee the most enduring granite from Massachusetts and the Virginias. Purely American this structure should be. A great hall for lectures, addresses, and general conventions of the society is greatly needed. It could be utilized on many occasions to produce a certain income for its support. Offices and committee rooms are required for the business of the society now more than a thousand in number, 
and soon to number many thousands. Safes are essential for the preservation of documents and relics. There should be a library unsurpassed in all branches pertaining to the records of the society and containing the largest, most complete collections of works upon American history. While our beloved First President General did not live to see how our society flourished beyond those early years, she set a tone at her address to the First Continental Congress, a challenge that emboldened our early members and continues to inspire us today. Our hope is in unity and self-sacrifice. Since the society was organized, and so much thought and reading directed to the early struggle of this country, it has been made plain that much of its success was due to the character of the women of that earlier era. The unselfish part they acted constantly commends itself to our admiration and example. If there is no abatement in this element of success in our ranks, I feel sure their daughters can perpetuate a society worthy of the cause and worthy of themselves. We now feel that this society is firmly established and in good condition for future success. It remains with us all to see that it lives and grows to greater and better ends. Madam President General, it is a privilege for me as the National Chairman of the Celebrate 125 Committee to express on behalf of all daughters, past and present, our heartfelt commitment to carry forward Mrs. Harrison's charge that our society lives and grows to greater and better ends. After 125 years of accomplishment, we rise with joy to face a future bright with promise, one built upon the soundest of foundations and the most enduring of missions. I congratulate you and the National Society on 125 years of service to America. And inspired anew by the words of our founders, I also suspect that the best is yet to come. Happy birthday, NSDAR. Thank you, Presley. It is so inspiring to know that at that organizing meeting 125 years ago with just 18 members in attendance, that the business they carried out that day is still guiding our organization today. We are so fortunate to have been founded by such strong and visionary women. In the years that followed that formative period, daughters everywhere fulfilled the joyful obligations of citizenship and membership in tens of thousands of ways and literally millions of lives were changed for the better as a result. New citizens, deserving students, men and women in uniform, veterans in need, all have been served by the DAR. Tens of thousands of patriot records and grave sites preserved and protected thanks to DAR. Thousands of local sites of historic significance would likely have disappeared long ago were it not for the DAR. No single evening could do justice to the breadth and scope of DAR's impact on America during the last 125 years. So I encourage you to learn more about our amazing history, to visit our website, subscribe to our award-winning American Spirit magazine, read our publications such as The American Treasure, The Enduring Spirit of DAR. I assure you that you too will be awed by the combined accomplishment of our organization. I learn new chapters of our history every day.